My name is Jean-Luc Toulou. I was the administrative director of the number one company on the water market, Veolia, for 30 years. I was responsible for the contracts with the southern districts of Paris. This work has shown me how an expansive corporation milks water consumers. That is why I wrote this book. Veolia offered me 1 million euros to prevent a court case which actually would have promoted the book. Naturally, I declined and was immediately fired. Afterwards, I was bombarded with lawsuits, but won all of them. We are standing on the banks on the River Seine, which divides Paris in two. Until the end of 2009, the Paris Water Administration was also divided. For 25 years, the administration of the southern area was handled by Lyonnaise de Zoul Suez, and the north by a company previously named Vivendi, today known as Veolia. The global players of the private water market, Veolia and Suez, are both French. Here, they administer 80% of the water supply. Both companies deny that this is a privatization, but rather a public-private partnership. Contrary to a regular privatization in the public-private partnership model, the assets remain owned by the community, but are administered by the corporations. Since privatization is continually being met with skepticism, the so-called French model, PPP, is gaining worldwide popularity. No other country has had more experience with Veolia, Suez, and this PPP model than France. Over the years, as an administrative employee at Veolia, it became clear to me what a scam the system of PPP really is, especially in the accounting and finance sector. This, of course, is affecting the price for water. In only the past 10 years, the price for water in Paris has risen by over 100%. Thanks to the resulting accumulation of profits, these companies were able to gradually expand. To begin with, it was just dealing water. Then sewage and consequently waste disposal, transportation and heating were also included. At the end of the 1980s, they bought into television, newspapers, music, school cafeterias and hospitals. Consumers living in Veolia or Suez operated cities, in fact, deal more or less with them several times a day. de France, the 144 municipalities surrounding Paris are joined together in a communal water board. Since over 60 years, the 5 million water clients are being provided by Veolia, paying substantially more for their water than those in Paris itself. At the end of 2009, the representatives of the communities decided between staying with the private operator or giving back the water into public hands. Just under half of the communities are in support of a public administration, joined by Jean-Luc Tully. However, the unions, surprisingly, stick to Veolia. Yes, we know Jean-Luc Toulou. We know him very well. He was in the company. Jean-Luc Toulou is not defending the interests of the employees in this case. 
Over a period of time, I was the number two in the Union CGT at Vivendi Violia U. During that time, the company offered me a bonus that would have doubled my income. There were several who accepted them, not me. For example, a union member, aged about 40, with 20 years in the company, received 60,000 euros instead of 30,000 euros. You see, he doubles his income. De 30 000 euros, bah, cet individu touche 60 000 euros. Et il double sa rémunération. For a single person, that's a lot, but for a company like Veolia, with its massive profits, it means nothing. Thus, you inexpensively buy social peace. Par rapport aux bénéfices colossaux. Donc, c'est acheter la paix sociale pour pas grand chose. But not only trade union members stick to Veolia. Are you to leave? Voilà. I know where you're fired. Does you? It's no coincidence that this gentleman knows the internal files of Veolia. André Santini, being the chairman of the Public Water Alliance, has to commission and control Veolia, because the alliance is, of course, the Les patrons, patron, and the publicly elected representatives are the legal owners of all plants, all pipelines, all facilities, even down to the last pencil, and the present operating company only does what it's asked to do. Yes, that's the way it should be. At the same time, Mr. Santini is chairman of the water administration of the Seine Normandie, which gives out cheap credits to, amongst others, Veolia. His delegate is even a board member of the board at Veolia, and so Mr. Santini may be getting confused as to who he's representing at present. Yeah, of course. Only a few months ago, Mr. Santini, as the chairman for the Public Water Alliance, sent a letter to all the mayors of the cities in the alliance with Veolia's company letterhead. They are that closely knit. Just imagine the Minister of Defense sending out a letter with a letterhead from a weapons manufacturing company. Several public representatives associate mainly financial interests with Veolia. In a secret vote, a majority decides upon a prolongation of the contract, which Veolia, after the announcement, wins. Corruption! The delegates should have declared their position in a public vote. A lot of money is at stake here. We're talking about an operating contract of over 300 million yearly. Veolia generates a win of up to 70 million per year. Without a doubt, this generated serious pressure. It is a good thing to combine the public representatives with the intelligence, the competence and the experience of the private companies. It is a great formula and this vote has confirmed it. Ladies, thank you. Grenoble, a city in the French Alps. Here, the other global player, Suez Lyonnais de So, has shown how the competence and experience of a private company are to be combined with the interests of the mayor. For a hundred years, the water was under public administration, which functioned really well. As I was elected into the city council of Grenoble in 1989, the pipes, canalization, water reservoirs and the water pump system were in good condition. The mayor at the time, who was the former environmental minister, decided, however, to privatize in 1989 and passed on the complete management of water to Lyonnais de Suez. Here is where Suez bribed the mayor. And it's here where the decision was made to privatize the water in Grenoble. This is also the place where the corrupt mayor was sentenced for privatizing the water to Lyonnais de Zor's advantage. 
The bribe sum of two million euros was paid to him in the form of trips, cruises, apartments, and by financing his election campaign. The three people from Suez mainly responsible were also sentenced with corruption. But the moral person, the company itself, was not sentenced. The chief executive at the time was Jérôme Monod, who later became the first advisor to the president of the Republic of France, Jacques Chirac. The mayor was Alain Carignon. He was sentenced to several years in prison. As we wrote the book, he was still minister of communication. That made our job difficult. When the book came on the market, he was already in jail. Throughout the whole time, he remained close to Sarkozy. He's seen on photos next to Mr. Sarkozy during the election campaign. The recent campaign electoral with the photo of Mr. Sarkozy. You see that on this montage here as well. Together, all is possible. And he remains a close friend to the highest person in the French state. We call it the lesson from Grenoble. Our water supply was in private hands for 10 years. Now it's been handled by the community again since 10 years. So we can compare. What happened during the time of privatization? Lyonnais de Zou confiscated the complete knowledge. They even printed their stamp on all the pipeline maps. They made the know-how and the heritage their own. At that time, there were no one left within the public service with enough knowledge and who could control them. The corporation raised the water prices and reduced pipeline maintenance and renovations to draw higher profits. This is the water price at the time of privatization. Privatization at Suez. The price goes up. We take it back into our hands. And here we see how the price has developed. At the same time, we've tripled the maintenance work, the renovations of the canal network and installations. We've compared the water prices in about 20 French cities based on our own calculations. There were cities in which the price was correct, mainly those under public administration, such as Chambéry, Grenoble or Clermont-Ferrand. We did, however, find cities where the prices were twice as high, like in Ile-de-France, Marseille, Montpellier or Reims. There you could lower the price for water by 30 to 40 percent. The water supply in Bordeaux is being operated by Suez. What makes the price so high here? During the examination of this question, a persistent finance controller came to some astonishing conclusions. Not even three years after the conclusion of the contract, the prices had risen by over 30%, while we were told it was only 15. So we informed ourselves at the local authority of Bordeaux. We spent a whole day there and between the two of us looked through a mountain of documents and left with over 700 photocopies. After working on it for six months, we finally managed to decipher the documents. 
For example, Lyonnais de Zoo told us a water meter for a private person with a diameter of 15 centimeters has a life expectancy of 12 years. So in their calculations, they calculated with a 12 years lifespan. But after a financial and technical inspection, we determined that these water meters actually have a lifespan of 23.8 years. So, in reality, they bill us for two water meters, while only having the cost of one. Another example. Lyonnais de Zoo stated the following. There will soon be an additional EU charge for lead piping and fittings. In accordance with this, we are increasing the rhythm of replacement by adding another 6,000 pipe connections in addition to last year's quota. This they declared in 1995. We examined all their annual reports between 1995 and 2006, and actually there were never 6,000 per year, but on average, only a quarter of that. That's only one example, but there are plenty of other small measures taken, which together add up to hundreds of millions of profit. They operate with these methods also in Bordeaux, Grenoble, Paris and other cities. This financial technique is the same everywhere. The local authorities association in Bordeaux, through investigations of their own, confirmed the conclusions of the finance controllers in 2005. But it took a court order for Suez to put the specific documents relevant to the association's investigation on the table. So it came as no surprise when the investigation concluded that the corporation, contrary to all previous statements, collects a 29% annual rate of return. Faced with these accusations, Suez responds. Matters like these quickly cause a lot of attention, so one has to look at them very carefully. And when it's concerning a private firm, people tend to fantasize. So let's really look at what we did in Bordeaux. We saved money, more so than was required by the contract. And why were we able to do this? We managed everything ourselves close to the source, so we were able to save money. We then shared this with the community. There are millions and again millions in private profits. Of course, it's normal. Private companies want to make money. But here, we're talking about unacceptable and unjustifiable income. In 2006, the local authorities forced Suez to an additional agreement added to the contract. The corporation has to pay back 233 million euros to the community. Unjustifiable profit generated through financial tricks. At the end of the contractual period, one thing is certain. One must return to public administration. I believe this is the only possibility. Another commonly used instrument of financial tactic is the so-called entrance fee. The water corporations pays large sums to the communities to attain the concession for the supplying of water. This money is considered a buyout or a gift to the community. In reality, it is usually just a credit, which the bill customers have to pay back through interest and interest on interest paid even manifold. This is also the case in Toulouse. Oui. 
By chance, we luckily came upon this document in the administration, which we quickly copied. It states the details of the payback installments of the entrance fee. 437,500 million francs are to be paid by Veolia to the city in two installments. Followed by the listing of the monthly rates and above all, the interest due upon repayment of the credit, it shows 10.44% is due on the first installment and 9.55% on the second. This proves that it was not a gift but a hidden credit. This was confirmed by the Toulouse Auditing Committee. And there you have it. The Audit Committee was put in place by the City of Toulouse in 2008. One of its purposes was to examine the financial reports of Veolia. And as a specialist, they hired the finance controller, Patrick Dufault de la Motte. We are here today for the last sitting of the Auditing Committee of the City of Toulouse. One of the reasons is that the city was given a very high entrance fee, namely 435.5 million francs. This is a heavy burden for the consumers of the city, since they are those who have to pay it back through the price for work. Meanwhile, the audit has shown that the oratory of the council was nothing but a lie. It showed that the entrance fee, in fact, is being paid back with the water prices, and the citizens of Toulouse have already paid the sum back two and a half to three times over. This is a significant reason for us to return to, well, maybe... Surely the return to public administration. We direct our criticism against the logic of the privatization of water. We did tell Veolia this at the beginning of the audit, and we have declared to them that our desire is to go back to public administration. The former mayor of Toulouse, Dominique Baudy, who in 1989 brought on the privatization, used the entrance fee to lower the local taxes. In Montpellier, they used it to finance a congress center. In Lille, they built a stadium. Elsewhere, community debts were paid. In every case, the elected city representatives used the entrance fee to gain popularity amongst their voters, for which the water consumers are continuously paying the bill. This way, Veolia and Suez have lured several mayors in France. The entrance fee is also internationally considered a deceptive door opener. In Germany as well, where the water plants are mostly still run by the public. According to Veolia, however, they have already in the past 10 years succeeded in finding their way into the supplying of water in 300 communities as a service provider or concessionaire, for example in Brunswick. What was most politically important to me was to secure the future of our city in the interest of our younger citizens. That meant to dismantle the enormous mountain of debt to secure the city's capacity to act and still invest. The largest part, which was also hotly debated, was the actual core of our city utilities, the Brunswick Utilities Company, delivering electricity, water and gas, and we privatized a smaller apartment complex, which profited much more than calculated. We privatized the complete street lighting, including the traffic light installations, like we did the wastewater disposal. We also privatized that to the company Alba. 
and a few years ago we almost reached the end mark by taking our biggest step in privatizing the disposal of wastewater. This also brought in just about a hundred million euros more. We got a higher sales price for this, 235 million. From this, we paid off a lot, older debts, and so on and so on. This, along with our savings, helped us dismount the burden of debts. The proceeds the city claims to have are in actuality to 100% a credit, which the city has to pay back, carried by additional fees year by year for the consumers, meaning the consumers are paying off this credit. The bank is entitled to a part of the interest, redemption of a loan for a period of 30 years, even if Veolia would cease to exist, that is, bankrupt. Veolia never paid a single cent for the license fee for the complete water management. They were given the right of utilization for nothing, free of charge. The credit that was taken is the means of a stooge, taken by the Wastewater Association Brunswick, a public authority under the control of the city itself. The city's debts are now outsourced to different companies and have to be paid back by the citizens. According to our calculations, the debt, which is now 230 million, will in 30 years have increased to about 500 million which the citizens then will have to come up with. Here we see a good example of what it looks like with new investments since the privatization of the wastewater industry. According to the sign, this is a high efficiency pump plant for 7.6 million euros. Veolia is not putting up any of its own money, so the city turned to the bank and used our fees in addition to the wastewater credit as security. It is still, however, on paper a private investment by Veolia, even though they have no responsibility for the money towards the credit. The consumer does. The Olia naturally writes this off as a tax deduction, as well as earning 25% of the planning costs on top. In the end, they've earned an additional million, outside of the service contract of the wastewater management. Everything running over credits and everything carried by the fees of the consumers. These are very complicated models, otherwise you would never arrive at these sums. Many say it can't be that Veolia is refunded for all of this, but that is the reality. Veolia didn't have to invest any of its own capital in the takeover in Brunswick, and they're still earning with it, not only through the operating recompense, but can also claim the complete costs for furnishings and equipment, everything over the bank credits. The consumers and the city are held accountable. Anyone can make this deal. So these affairs, especially regarding wastewater, are complicated. So complicated that the public in general don't understand. And I have to say, not even everyone on the board of council understands them completely. This is the problem, by the way, that the councillors never get to see these contracts in full. They can look at them, but are not allowed to make copies. It is very unusual for us to have access to this compact disc containing the contracts. It was secretly given to us by someone in the administration.
1st, 2009, after 25 years of private water administration, the city is preparing to take back the supplying of water, giving it back completely to Eau de Pati. Step by step, we want to take back control over the water in Paris. This means the control returns to City Hall. We have established examination committees and have developed studies. Already in 2003 and 2004, we renegotiated the contracts to reclaim the investment reserves from the operators. The chief executives of Veolia and Suez didn't take it too well, as we learned from the press. They labeled the recommunalization as a mistake. In this French newspaper, they stated the following on the topic. Proclio, the chief executive of Veolia, called the mayor of Paris and yelled furiously. Without the contract in Paris, Veolia wouldn't get any assignments abroad anymore. The topic, recommunalization, didn't leave Suez cold either. I don't think one should always put the public administration in opposition with a private service. In reality today, there are only public-private partnerships. And it would be good if you would help us implement this political direction of sustainability. This is about a global cultural revolution, and this is where we need you to be. But not in a debate, I'm sorry, which basically doesn't make any sense. Water needs money. No water makes money. No. Water is common property, a basis for existence. For this reason, it should be administered by the public. With the changeover to a single public water administrator in Paris, we will be able to save a minimum of approximately 30 million euros annually. A large portion of that would have been the operator's profit. Thereby, the complete generated profit will flow back into the supplying of water. That money will not be used for anything else. That's an important point. This way we can keep the price for water stable and still assure a high level of investment and service. Other than that, the public administration of water, through the provisions, allows for a long-term asset management. We can then structure our investments according to the requirements since they are based on the life expectancy of the commodities. We are not kept within the boundaries of a private delegation contract, limited to a period of 5, 10 or 20 years. This well is over 200 years old and still functioning. It is uninteresting for a private operator to invest in a centuries-old structure. Their contracts are limited to 30 years, but investments within the area of water are only profitable after 30 to 60 years. That is why private investors refrain from investing any capital of their own into channels. It is simply not profitable. A public operator does not have these restraints. He can plan in decades and make long-term commitments to assure that the resource water is used sparsely and provided with optimal protection. The protection of larger bodies of water is a big challenge. This assures that the water doesn't have to be so heavily treated, which is costly, and thus will always be a remedial measure. Ecological protection makes more sense, of course. The Van Valley, a Paris groundwater extraction area.
protéger sa ressource. To protect the resources, Eau de Paris bought land here. The goal is to permanently alter the local agriculture to gain influence over the resources. We lease the grounds practically free of charge to the farmers, so they accept our requirements and cultivate the land the way we want. Pour que lui puisse respecter des contraintes et cultiver ces parcelles-là comme nous on le souhaitons. The adjustment will take about five, six years until we are 100% organic. This influences the water, the ground, the well-being and health of the people. That's why it was logical for us to join with Eau de Paris. Of course we'd like a large-scale organic cultivation very soon where an improvement of the quality of water would be recognizable, but that is still a dream of the future. Back in Grenoble. Nous sommes là dans une des plus grandes zones de protection. We are now in one of the largest water protection areas in Europe, acquired a hundred years ago. Here we become aware of why those responsible have to think of the future, of the next ten, hundred years. The protection zone makes it possible to cultivate natural and untreated water. This well water needs neither to be treated with chlorine nor with ozone. It is naturally clean. It is better than most mineral water out of the bottle. Naturellement pure, bien meilleur que la plupart des eaux en bouteille, des eaux minérales qui sont vendues en bouteille. As I was elected, I had an argument with the prefect, who was a big supporter of working with chlorine. It is much easier to work with chlorine. On the other hand, it is a lot more difficult to prepare high-quality, controlled water throughout the distribution net without chlorine. For this, you need facilities along the canalization and staff who care for it consciously. Only then can you be certain to get water of the best quality. Back in Bordeaux, Suez Lyonnaise invites the public to a water tasting. The corporation is cultivating the cleanest of waters here, out of an aquifer, a groundwater reservoir dating back to ancient times. And still... It tastes like chlorine. It's tap water. You smell it. If the chlorine smell is too strong for you, let the water sit for a while. To us, chlorine is a sign of quality. The advantage of water treated with chlorine is that drinking water remains disinfected no matter what. Even when the pipe network hasn't been properly maintained or the pipes aren't regularly restored or repaired, this saves money and staff and is considered an efficiency win. Though it is not healthy, it is scientifically proven that the usage of chlorine against the generation of harmful reaction products, without a doubt, increases the risk for cancer. Threats to the water quality do, however, also lurk in the shortage of the resource water. From 2013 to 2015 on, we will have to cut back 30 million of the 150 million cubic meters of water being used in the region of Gironde to maintain the deep ground water level. 
To enable this cutback of 30 million cubic meters, there are two basic possibilities. Looking for new reservoirs, which means, for instance, pumping water from the river Garonne, or water-saving cutbacks. As second mayor, I've been adamant about introducing the principle of less usage. The measures to be taken were first and foremost fighting the leakages in the pipe system caused by broken pipes. This would result in lowering the usage of water in urban areas by 25%. In an article in the magazine Dimanche, severe losses of water in the water networks were being reprimanded. The loss of water is drastically higher in the privately operated networks compared to the ones operated by the public. In France, Veolia puts on average only a third of the budget financed by the water consumers towards pipe maintenance. If a pipe bursts, it's categorized as renewal, for which the consumer is charged extra. A private operator has no interest in repairing leakages, since only what's being used is calculated. Why then save water? In the beginning, Suez was campaigning with slogans such as one shower equals the cost of a stamp or one car wash costs you an egg. One can't say that there is a shortage of water in Bordeaux. That wouldn't be correct. But the groundwater level suffers from several negative influences brought on by drought. Here you can use foresight and take precautions. So we consider new purification techniques such as artificial refiltering. Suez focuses on techniques such as the advancement of additional water from the river Garon. River water that after filtering gets pressed into the ground to add to the groundwater. This however doesn't measure up to the existing water quality of the aquifer. This is because not even remotely or harmful substances can be filtered out of the river water. In any case, there is a lot of residue in the Garonne water. You'll find night treatment creams as well as headache substances, such as aspirin in the water, pharmaceutical substances as well as cleaning detergents, even pesticides and fertilizers, a whole list of varied substances. That means if the water quality is bad, it affects the drinking water. It's worth thinking about. The effects of polluted rivers on drinking water reach a significant level in the northwestern corner of France and Bretagne. Mountains of algae grow everywhere in the bay here. For geographical reasons, only the surface water can be a resource for drinking water. Water that along the coastlines allow the algae to grow. They collect the algae washed in with the tide and dump them here to drain. Then they get transported elsewhere, however, we don't really know where. There is no room for it anywhere. This year, 20 tons of algae were gathered on this beach, but one should by no means spread these wastes upon the fields, since that raises the toxicity of the water. 
The water quality here is disgusting. We have more than 80 milligrams of nitrate per liter of water, which you find along the steep coastline and in the rivers here. Ninety-five percent of the nitrate comes from the intense farming. This means the liquid manure goes straight into the groundwater, then into the river, fertilizing the green algae. This year, there is 40% more algae than before. But what's really bad is that these rotting algae contain a multitude of chemical products, steaming from animal feed. For example, beta blocker, penicillin, antibiotics, and heavy metals, which stabilize the food for the animal. All of these products combined are turning into a devastating chemical bomb in our waters. Finalement, deviennent en fait une bombe de destruction massive dans notre eau. This is where the famous Britannic oysters are cultured. It's hard for me to say, but I've concluded that more and more oysters die. Before, it was rather the exception. Back then, everyone was surprised when it happened. But today, we constantly have dead ones in every phase of the cultures. Starting with the newly born, and those up to 18 months old, even the two-year-olds, and finally amongst the oysters about to be sold. There are pesticides and insecticides. It's not clear there exactly what's happening. As in the water cultivation and the treatment of the drinking water, we don't know. For example, I don't drink champagne anymore. Well, because the wine is extremely treated. The gathering of algae during low tide and the nitrates are visible signs of the water pollution. Other kinds of water pollution can't be smelled or tasted. Those are the pesticides, and they are far worse, but invisible. And the pesticides, as well as the nitrates, aren't just in the water, but also, and maybe even more so, in vegetables and fruit, and thereby also in the wine. In the legumes, in the fruits, y compris d'ailleurs dans le vin. Do people here drink tap water? Oh, no. mm, not much. One finds it a bit peculiar. And you? Me? No, no. Not since years. Since I heard... No, since my mother was on the local council. They told her we have a problem. The people have to be warned. I was not to drink this water or I'd never have children. Well, I haven't any children, but that's nothing to do with the water. I just missed out, that's all. Get down there, you beast. The river alone. Its water contains 46 milligrams of nitrate per liter. The recommended European Union limit is 25 milligrams per liter, a drinking water refinery for the community of Brest. Here the water is extracted, then it's cleaned with sand, and the final purification is achieved by filtering. And here the ozone is produced. It disinfects the water by killing bacteria and viruses. 
Then the water is sent to the reaction breast. After the preparation cycle, Viola's own laboratory still measures 28.5 milligrams of nitrate per liter drinking water. As a whole, we have a water containing many substances which we are unable to filter out. Therefore, one can speak of a real public danger. Even the city council of the Platonic Metropole, Brest, is alarmed. In the future, we must invest several tens of millions in drinking water. For today, our options for water treatment are almost at an end. Confronted with the growing problems of pollution and water quality, one focuses primarily on the kind of healing. The technologies that are being developed are even more complex and cleverly refined. This is of course interesting for companies like Veolia and Suez. That's why they continuously develop new technologies. Ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, or reverse osmosis. But this is running directly into a dead end, because there will always be more pollution, and already today, all of this is extremely expensive. It would be much more important to reduce pollution at the source, through, for example, the protection of the water resources, or switching to biological agriculture. To reach the goal of clean water, there mustn't be any private interests involved, due to the fact that treating wastewater is in their interest. We really have to give the complete water administration, the supply networks, as well as production, over to the public authorities. l'ensemble de la gestion de l'eau, aussi bien la distribution que la production. Voilà. Did you know that Brest has one of the highest prices for water in all of France, especially the first cubic meters? It was privatized 25 years ago. The contract runs out in 2012, and we are running a campaign to return to a public water administration. Several contracts are running out in 2012. All the larger cities in Finisterre, Compère, Morlaix, Landorneau and Brest are connected by a network with the other cities in Finisterre in order to put pressure on the public authorities. We want to implement the return to public administration. Is the recommunalization in the interest of the public and the consumer? I would answer this question with a yes. The public water protection area of the commune Pontivy in Bretagne, excursion of the environment network Courants Est. Since a long time, Coherence is convinced that to attain clean water, one has to support a sustainable organic agriculture. This is our only possibility to regain the quality of water. The network Coherence organizes study trips to Bavaria since many years to show examples like Munich, where they, earlier than we, have become aware that we must maintain the quality of water. The South German city, Munich. It's common knowledge amongst the public and within politics why we have the highest quality water. Of course, it is in part due to our beneficial position right at the foot of the Alps. But it's also due to the fact that our city utilities are cultivating the largest ecological agricultural area in Europe, within our water resource area. 
And this is because our public authorities keep future generations in mind when making plans that span decades for highest water quality care. Private operators, on the other hand, have to declare their profits in the next quarterly statement and gear everything towards satisfying the shareholders, analysts and the rating agencies. That's why we defend the public control of the water market. Looking at the curve describing the nitrate levels, you find that it was constant over several years. But at one time, in the 60s, it rose drastically. Our nitrate content levels was at 14 milligrams per liter, almost perfect levels for some communities. But regardless of this, we declared that we must develop a new strategy. The reason being that it's an important task for a water provider to minimize critical values and not maximize them. We had a revolutionary idea in 1992 to implement ecological agriculture. We wrote all the farmers asking them if they would be interested in ecological farming. In the end, we made it financially interesting to allow for an easier transition. Today we have 110 farmers under contract at a nitrate level of 7 milligrams. We are the Krull family, Anna and Anton Krull. Personally, I don't regret at all that we changed. Actually, it's more in line with our view of life, and it's easier to operate. Naturally, we get more for the milk and the meat, obviously, and a bonus from the public services as well. As an ecological farm, you're only allowed to have two cattle or horses per hectare. This practically guarantees that I can't over-fertilize the ground. We can offer our contribution as long as the people in Munich appreciate it. The appreciation of the consumers using the water returns to us. So it's a give and take. Alone we have no impact and neither do the consumers using the water. Privatization is only appealing on the first day, when you cash in the proceeds. But then you realize you don't have any influence, no say in the matter. You are in the hands of the investment decisions of distant corporate headquarters. You can't influence the prices, neither the biological quality. You've signed off as local council. Brussels, the capital of Belgium. Here we have an example that hopefully will teach a few lessons and make the public sector of all of Europe think. I am definitely willing to discourage anyone anywhere from carelessly venturing into a collaboration in which private partners are given so much free reign. The water supply in Brussels was 100% run by the community until 2001. Then a Viola Daughter company, Aquirus, were commissioned the North Brussels wastewater refinery plant as a public-private partnership because of their new technique to dispose of sewage sludge. From here you have a view on uh, that very new and exclusive system 
Through this system, the sewage sludge is being reduced. A ton of sludge turns into a 50 kilo sack of sand. We are naturally very proud to have something so new, beautiful and big. The plant was officially opened on the 11th of March in 2008. Our king attended the opening. Having such a great new station was considered an important matter. They closed the three collectors in front of the plant and routed the wastewater for more than a million citizens straight into the waterways, into the Senna and the waterways downriver. From an ecological point of view, this was an absolute catastrophe. The sewage treatment plant remained out of service for about 10 days, which is disastrous. 10 days. 10 days without wastewater treatment. Of course, technical problems could have occurred on a publicly operated plant. However, we would have never allowed such a drastic stop of the plant the way the private operators did. De la station d'épuration comme ça a été fait par le par le privé. Et donc c'est là qu'il y a. And that's the main point that the public was faced with actions that had already taken place through the abrupt shutdown of the plant by the private operators. Cette station d'épuration par le privé. The operation has always been working. It's the treatment of the mud that did stop working as it should do, and that was then done uh, in containers and then send it to, to Germany. From what I hear, that's an enormous amount of trucks every month. They had problems with this system for months. Yes, and now they apparently claim they found the solution. But this solution would be very expensive. That's why this whole conflict is now revolving around the question, who is to pay for the improvement of the plant? Aquarius has already requested an additional 40 million. At the moment, what they are doing is they are trying to restart it, so they are making tests. This is why the sand is still a bit wet and very black and stinky. It shouldn't be like that. So it's just on the process. So for the moment, the worst case scenario would be that this whole concept cannot work at all. Tatos is absolutely in the experimental stage. They perform tests, but on a really small scale in Toulouse. That's where the formula was tested. This article makes some very, very serious and detailed uh, accusations that, for example, the call to proposals has been changed in the middle so that it would allow an experimental technology such as the Athos process to compete. Another claim they make is that Veolia made a lot of pressures uh, through the French state, through different uh, lobbies they had, through different networks they had, uh, that they invited a whole bunch of politicians and high officials of the administration on big yachts in Saint-Tropez just before the, the selection. So the man says, oh, so how do you find it? And the other one is, oh, it's, it's very nice. This uh, aftertaste of uh, corruption gives it a very, very pure taste. The Regional General Accounting Office of Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur, who checked the accounts of one of Veolia's branch offices, found the following. One overnight with dinner and breakfast in Mougain for a manager of a water branch, 4,140 francs. Participation in a cantonal district election campaign, 10,000 francs. Trips to Malta and Sardinia for a business partner not contracted, 170,000 francs. 
uh, Sten in St. James Club in Paris for a delicate from Vareste, 5,120 francs. Fees for a lawyer from the Alp Maritime, for no given reason, 270,000 francs. Two bills from a partner association currently involved in a legal procedure, 1,362,929 francs. Travel expenses and a stay in Cardiff for four persons, two of which for an executive manager of the local authority of arrest, 32,024 francs. This is stated by the Regional General Accounting Office, so this is what we pay with our water bills. Favors, but also payments of significant sums to influential decision makers. The South French Montpellier. La gestion de l'eau à Montpellier. I find the management of water in Montpellier disgusting. There have been cases of corruption and of people taking advantage of the situation. The city council granted Veolia, formerly Compagnie Générale des Eaux, an operating leasing agreement in 1989. In 1994, a Congressional Investigation Committee was established, which then sentenced Compagnie Générale des Eaux for corruption and for bribery. The company paid 8 million francs to a department within reign of the Communist Party to force them to vote for the operating lease agreement, which they did. The briber was sentenced, those bribed were not. Despite the conviction of those responsible at the time from Veolia in Montpellier, Jean-Dominique de Champ, the management of water is still in the hands of the corporation. But also in the universities does Veolia, along with Suez, play a significant part. Suez holds a professorship at the School for Water and Forest Management. Also in University too, soon another professorship will be granted to Veolia. A Veolia professorship with the task to teach and develop research areas, presumably within their field of expertise and competency, water. This is all a blatant sign of how strongly meshed together science and the economical interests of the operators and other financial interests really are. Maybe it's not so clever that Monsieur Bichou, the regional manager of the southern district of Eolia, is at the head of the center of competency. Equally as inept, perhaps, is naming the fusion of the local water science companies Suelia, as if it were a merging of Suez and Veolia. Hence, it is conceivable that these research centers increasingly, if not solely, develop into a utilitarian science, obediently serving the operators. The Aero Valley. The scientific promoters of the Competence Center and other scientists from Montpellier's second university made an assessment in 2005, certifying the rapidly growing metropolis Montpellier with inexhaustible water resources. Philippe Machtel is a high-ranking scientist and mayor of saint gouen le dessert the neighboring community. It is really an absurd story. Some scientists wanted fame and jumped on this occasion, claiming we had here two cubic meters of water per second at our disposal. Voila, here we are in front of the main entrance of the source of the saint Fon spring. I'll show you the sound of the water. Here's the stone. There is a tiny noise after a fall of about 10 meters. According to the test pumping, the levels of the spring water has fallen to 50 meters below the river.
The lesson from this story, after 10 days, they had to halt the catastrophic pump endeavor because there was no more water. One has to keep in mind that they risked harming the unique biotope of the river Eru. The water has about 13 degrees Celsius, meaning it's really, really cold. The temperature of the river Arose water, however, can reach 25 to 30 degrees in the summer. A real problem, because the spring water cools the river water on its way down. And this has a biological impact. If you eliminate the cold water spring, the temperature of the river rises and its health declines. And thus, the things were set in motion towards scientific and political absurdity. It has to be developed. There is a lot of money in it. Water is a gold mine. If you meddle in this corrupt system, or give grants, credits, or gifts, then you have to very generously spread your money. Even environmental organizations, even those I really value, such as French Nature Environment, are being generously financed by Violia Propriété, or Actions Against Hunger, the Red Cross, La Solidarité, and others. Even in the Catholic aid organization, Secours Catholique, the one responsible for issues regarding water is a former chief of staff at Violia. On every level, we're up against a complete overlapping of roles. And when politicians lose an election, they get hired by Suez or Violia. They hire people with the power to influence the commissioning of official public assignment contracts or influence those members of Congress who create the laws. For example, deciding on alteration requests, ultimately allowing them access to construction assignment contracts, such as the adaptation of the canal system to newer standards, things that are immediately beneficial to them. They are creating supply and demand themselves with the help of government officials and their lobbyists. Brussels, the European Union Parliament, and the attempts to unravel the widely ramified network through which Veolia is affecting the European Union. The lobbying of Veolia environment in Brussels um, in, the wa in water, basically you can say it is important to have a very, very wide and diversified lobbying network to be efficient. What is important is to have the same kind of message delivered through as many channels as possible. So you can use think tanks to organize, to organize debates, you can use general business lobbies, you can use specialized water lobbies, such as this, those ones, and you can use global bodies, such as the World Water Forum, etc. For example, Veolia is dominating one body which is very closely advising DG Research about what kind of projects, research projects, it should fund in the five coming years. They are uh, the main funders, I think, I think they are the biggest funders of an entity which is called the Water Supply and Sanitation Technology Platform. So this means basically Veolia is influencing the Commission 
on a research project, it will apply to afterwards. So basically, it will get the European Commission funding project it has asked to be funded. The privatization waves in Europe were never brought on by a large public discourse, but always by a sudden court decision made by the European Supreme Court of Justice, with the intention to force entry into one market or other, or a guideline by the European Commission. And that's why I say, be awake is the rule of thumb. The corporations who wish to break into these business areas continue to exist, and they are constantly rattling the gate of entry to these markets. The Speaker for the European Union Commission opened the declaration on the 19th of May 2009. Water is a commodity like everything else. Thereby, the intention of the European Union Commission was affirmed to open up the market for private firms by obligating the public utilities to request proposals. The system today is a true financial dictatorship, and the water is held hostage by this financial dictatorship. Istanbul, Turkey. The biggest lobby event in the world concerning water, the World Water Forum, is held here in 2009. Initiated by the World Water Council, a governing body named by the water corporations Veolia and Suez, the World Bank, and some other supporters. Along with the self proclaimed Global Water Organization, Ministers, highly influential politicians, UN representatives and the big water business come together under the roof of the private corporations. The problem is, will we in 20 years time have enough water for everyone to access? And how do we assure that everyone will have access to water? This is the difficulty discussed throughout this forum because being able to get water is the dignity of men and women. They came together in 1997 and they set up these forums every three years and at first we all, I think a lot of us thought, well this would be a good opportunity to really talk about the world crisis, but it became very clear very fast that this is a big trade show for the water corporations and it's a way of giving themselves legitimacy when they say, well we have the answers to the world's water crisis and so when they put on a forum like this with thousands and thousands of people, it looks like the whole world's here and everybody agrees and that's the optic they want, that's what they need, that's what they need to look like. But it's a lie, it's just a big house of cards. They elected themselves, the lords of water just decided, me, 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 why don't you, I'll be chair, you'll be vice chair, oh okay, I guess that's democratic. Not. <laughs> Not. This is a large trade fair where participants from all over the world present their most modern technologies. We passed a new law in the field of public-private partnership. Now PPP is also possible in the irrigation branch. With PPP we want to irrigate 3.5 million hectares. The private investors are building the irrigation system and will operate it. The water will then be sold to the farmers.
uh, uh, public-private partnership. It's a financing model, not you know selling the water. It's just uh, another form of financing the projects. That's privatized by any name. What Suez and Veolia say is, well, we're not doing that anymore. What we're doing now is public-private partnerships, and that is the public keeps control, but we do the delivery, and we're so efficient, and we do such a great job. It's just gobbledygook. It's the same thing. Private delivery on a for-profit basis is exactly the same as if you're running it. The government signs the contract and hands it over to the corporation. That's privatized by any name. If it's walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Maud Barlow is a participant at the Alternative Opposition Forum to which numerous people affected and critics of the privatization of water have traveled from all over the world. Veolia Environment, then uh, trading as Vivendi, obtained a contract uh, to manage water in Nairobi. And then the government of Kenya would guarantee 15% uh, of the revenue from water would go to Veolia. And they would have to increase the cost of water every year by 40%. cost of water became expensive and a lot of people were not able to access water anymore and uh, had their water disconnected. They had also proposed that the city council had to lay off uh, 3,500 workers and to hire 45 new experts, people from France. The cost of hiring this very small group of people from Veolia was going to cost more than the city was paying for 3,500 Kenyans. The government uh, was forced to reverse the contract with Veolia. That means from uh, July 2001, the Veolia wasn't uh, operating the water anymore. The problem with reversing the contract, of course, we know is that uh, we don't know how much money the government had to pay to reverse the contract. Uh, but we know that uh, shortly after that, the government had to borrow money from the World Bank. The success of the World Water Forum disturbs those who have run out of things to say. We will continue. We will continue just as we have since years and continue fighting for those who have no access to water. Veolia and Suez came to the United States and they said that privatization would be the wave of the future and they aggressively went after large cities. They fire half the staff, that's where the economic efficiency comes from that they claim they have. Prices usually double. Suez immediately demanded an increase of the water price of 700 percent compared to the public utilities. Afterwards, all political fractions, churches, intellectuals and also the army agreed to a people's referendum in order to put into Uruguay's constitution the human right to access water. The referendum was accepted with 64.7%. Suez finally left the country in September 2006. They also had to leave Argentina and after that Bolivia as well. Buenos Aires, Atlanta, Cochabamba, Johannesburg, Stockton and Felton are only the most famous examples of the successful fight for recommunalization. The reclaiming of the management of water back into public hands is turning into a worldwide trend.
Italy, for example, here it seems a national referendum is successful in preventing the privatization of water intended by Berlusconi, head of the government. Or Germany. Having already had experience with privatization, recommunalization is the trend. As for example in Stuttgart, here the city council decided, with a large majority, to recommunalize the management of water, run by the Veolia-owned EDF, as the result of a civil referendum. In the capital Berlin as well, also through a civil referendum, here, Veolia and RWE had taken over the management through confidential contracts. Have you heard about our civil referendum? You are paying for what the corporations are taking. The most impressive recommunalization ways is however in the home country of the corporations Veolia and Suez. Back in Paris, 2010. Voila, now we have a publicly run water administration in Paris, after having entrusted it to Veolia and Suez for 25 years. All of the responsibilities regarding water are back in public hands. This is a historic decision for the Water Management Service. In two-thirds of the cities in France, contracts with the private operator Suez and Veolia are simultaneously running out. This is the challenge to return to public administration. Alongside of Paris, many other cities will use this chance. Bordeaux, Toulouse, Montpellier, Brest and Marseille, and now also Lille. We've had enough of the eternal price increases. We've had enough of the corruption dominating the private water market. We've had enough of the lack of transparency in water politics. The return to public administration is now a possibility.